Okay. Okay, um, my thesis is about a hypothetical artifact-based project, uh, namely a dashboard application. Uh, it is not real, but it is based on a lot of the work that I've done of late uh, at my job. Um, the primary research question is, can a focus on user-centered design be used to quickly construct a meaningful business intelligence dashboard application? Uh, that is quickly and without using extensive resources. Uh, will it be faster, better, and cheaper than, say, a uh, top-down technological approach or a more traditional design approach? And this is a big question where I work um, because everything needs to be done faster, better, and cheaper. So the scenario in this uh, case is... Um, in the legal department of a software company. The chief counsel uh, needs a way to track the status and activity of litigation matters worldwide. Uh, they do business in 44 countries, have over 80 legal staff in 17 of those countries. Uh, the chief counsel and his staff have to be able to report regularly on these matters, and they're looking for a way to stay on top of uh, data such as cost estimates, uh, upcoming key dates, case status, uh, accrual needs, and so on. The problem of gathering the data has already been solved in that all the data are already collected in an automated fashion uh, and reside in one location. Um, the issue is making sense of that data and to do so quickly. So the, the theories involved here, I believe, are, are human-centered design and user-centered design, um, both aim to make applications more usable by focusing on the input of the end users rather than uh, a focus on the developers. Um, I apologize, this, apologize if this uh, slide is a little busy, but I do, I do love both these diagrams. Uh, the human-centered human design seeks that, um, what we call the sweet spot between what the business needs which is the viability, what the technology affords, the feasibility, uh, and what appeals to the end users, which is the usability. Um, and we put that into practice through the application of user-centered design. Uh, we have a few variations on this theme here at work uh, in the software industry. Uh, echoes of it can be seen in uh, agile development uh, and the renewed focus on, on CX, which is the customer experience, or UX, the user experience. Um, it's different than the traditional uh, or waterfall development where the process flows only in one direction, uh, where the end user is consulted at the beginning, and then uh, it's not until the end when the product is almost built that they get involved again. Uh, user-centered design has the users as the focal part of the process from the beginning, the entire process is actually built around continuous feedback from their experience developing and using the application. Their needs and perspectives are the driving force in what becomes an iterative, repeating process. Uh, while this type of development should yield a more useful uh, product in the end, I believe it can also provide an increased speed with which a product can be put into practice for the benefit of the end users. Uh, in terms of methodology, it's uh, similar to a contextual design methodology, but with more iteration, uh, less of focus on documentation, more of an emphasis on speed, uh, and sort of an understanding that the design is never really finished, per se. Uh, it starts with talking to the end users, trying to identify what really matters to them, quickly building a series of use cases for their desired solution, how are they going to use it? Uh, then prototyping something that delivers the biggest bang for the buck, uh, what meets their needs best with what's readily available. Um, then having them test, explore, and critique what comes from that, bringing further changes and possible new use cases uh, for that solution, which leads to further exploration of what they're looking for, further changes and suggestions, further testing, and so on. The process is iterative, uh, almost infinitely so, uh, as I've tried to hint here. 
but actually it doesn't only flow in one direction. Each step can feed back on itself or on previous steps at any time. It all starts with capturing the needs of the uh, end users. Uh, the quest for usability is something that we're obsessed with at my job. If the users don't find your product usable or necessary or helpful, they will never use it, even if it is demonstrably better than what they've got. Uh, starting with their needs and wants as the engine of the process will lead to a more adopted and ultimately usable product in the end. And traditionally, this starts with uh, something along the lines of semi-structured interviews uh, with various users to look for common themes. Uh, however, in a situation like my work, or in my th hypothetical here, uh, where participants are geographically dispersed or resources are limited, we have to start with a convenience sample, uh, folks willing to help out at the start. Um, while this is necessarily limiting, it's not so bad as only those interested in the project will make the time to be involved, and that means the initial feedback comes from those most likely to use the end product. Uh, but we're seeking ways to speed up the process, and that's where the use of personas comes in. Uh, these are archetypes derived from user behaviors in the initial group of end users that we spoke to, and the designer's existing knowledge of the rest. Uh, we boiled down the known characteristics of dozens of users into three or four archetypes and proceed with the design based on those. Uh, this helps focus the design and keep it moving forward even when the designers can't have direct access to the users. Uh, it also forces the, uh, the designers to think about and <clears throat> empathize more with the plight of their end users. The next phase is the development of use cases. Although the quest for usability is paramount, we still have to take into account the other factor, factors we mentioned earlier, and the use case helps address viability. We have a beginning understanding of the needs of our users. Now we seek to understand exactly how they would use the system being developed. A use case is a detailed description of what this application will do for the user and how they will interact with it. If they're given the system to meet the needs described before, what would it look like? How would it act? The use case is a way to put those requirements in the context of the how, why they're needed. Use cases are a great way to get more concrete by nailing down the details of what the software is supposed to do. <clears throat> and by doing so, the end users, designers, and programmers can all get on the same page and share a common understanding of the goals of the project. They can also uncover gaps in the design ideas or in the resources. Uh, perhaps another solution already exists, or the proposed use may not be worth the investment of time or money. That's the viability again. And that would come through when describing exactly what the users want the software to do. The next step, now that we have a clearer understanding of what the users are looking for, is to create a prototype to explore with the users how they would use the application. This is where the feasibility gets explored. Now these prototypes can be as simple as a literal sketch on a piece of paper or as complex as an interactive dashboard that will look and feel like the finished product. <clears throat> the prototypes serve as a way to explore those use cases we just discussed, making the designs more tangible, which should make obvious any design problems not already discovered. One way to help speed up development at this stage is the use of data sketches. These are low fidelity, low end designs, not built from scratch, but done using tools that are readily available to both the designers and the end users, such as a common software program like Word or PowerPoint, or in this case, Google Sheets. This allows us to get a prototype in front of the end users quickly to open up the design, fix the problem, and make changes without a large upfront investment of money or development time. Studies have shown that visualizing dashboards through data sketching has not only sped up their development, but has encouraged new ideas and other innovations not seen earlier. And that serves as a great way to engage the end users by using their feedback in these iterative cycles so that they can see the development happen. Studies have also shown that 
<clears throat> that process promotes a willingness on their part to help with future testing and design work. Speaking of testing, the next stage is to put the functional design developed and prototyping to the test. A way to do that while still promoting rapid development is a method developed by Microsoft called Write, Rapid Iterative Testing and Evaluation. Here, everyone involved, the designers, engineers, and decision makers, observe real users performing real tasks on a functional application. The goal is to fix any problems immediately, since all hands are on deck, so to speak, not just identify them, and to do it as part of the design process. Studies have shown that this method produces better products in shorter periods of time by doing the analysis, discussion, changes, and testing of those changes all during this phase instead of later on or in a different version of the software. A key part of that testing is the use, as much as possible, of real data. Real data is recognizable to the end users who interact with it naturally, providing better engagement on their part and a more realistic and complete study of issues to those on the development side. And finally, this testing should include, again, as much as possible, a broader group of users than the convenient sample we've been working with up to this point. Those who are reluctant to participate in the early stages are less so once there is a product to work on, and that can provide both feedback to see if what you've been working on has broad appeal and a chance to discover something that you weren't aware of earlier. And that, of course, can iterate back to capturing the needs of these new users and then so on and so forth. Uh, what, I've, what I've learned from this project, uh, first of all, is ease of entry. That is, finding the easy entry points for the audience. I did, this has become incredibly important. Most of uh, my users are experts in their, in their fields, not uh, application developers. They're busy people with limited time. Uh, they don't want to spend it in training or designing. Um, what they dread more than anything is a blank screen or a blank sheet of paper. They are more than willing to give their opinions on something that already exists. Uh, and this, this uh, affects everything from the choice of platform, uh, hence Excel or Google Sheets, which they are familiar with, uh, to finding ways for them to explore the designs and prototypes on off hours and report back their experience. Uh, if we don't make it easy for them to get involved in the process, uh, they're not going to uh, give us the feedback we need to develop a better application. Uh, I also worry about the limited uh, applicability of these methods to speed up development on a broader scale. Um, many of the studies uh, mention this as a caveat as well. Most of those uh, studies I've come across are in the medical field. Uh, with large groups of doctors and patients who are kind of a, a captive audience. Um, my experience is only with small groups. I would love to be involved in a larger study in my field uh, to see what the results would be. Uh, and finally, this re reinforced the importance of the role of the designer, despite the intense focus on the end user. Uh, studies have shown that designers' attention to such things as heuristics, uh, especially concerns about consistency, um, recognition over recall, simple minimalist designs. Uh, they have helped accelerate the development of applications as well. And I'd love to explore that uh, further going forward. Um, I, can, I can show you the dashboard. So let's, let's take a look at what it is. Okay, um, another lesson I've, I've learned from this is that uh, less is more. In my recent experience at work, I, uh, doing something similar to this, I had all sorts of additional charts and the calendar lookup, uh, all of which the users deemed unnecessary and confusing. So again, usability is what matters. Uh, and in this, it's a very simple thing. Uh, for the chief counsel and his staff to get a quick handle on where the lawsuits are, what is next on the calendar, um, where the money is being accrued, how big the claims are, and so on. Um, the first item you see is a world map, uh, which I thought was unnecessary, but was popular with the team. 
Um, it shows lawsuits faced uh, around the world. Uh, you can click into the map uh, and wander around to, to see um, <clears throat> how many lawsuits are in each country. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown. Um, up here we can also switch, by the way, to legal staff to see where all of our legal staff is, but we'll get back to that in one moment. Uh, going back to the lawsuits. Okay. Uh, below the map, you'll see there's a list of all the lawsuits uh, with the information that the chief counsel is interested in seeing. Uh, they are listed in the order of next significant date. Again, I had wanted to put in a, uh, a calendar app that could pull up uh, what was happening in the next week or so. Um, the users in, in my real case decided that wasn't necessary. If they're just listed in order of date, they can see that uh, this first case has something due on May 1st and um, they can uh, reach out to the attorney, find out what it is, uh, understand more about it just by seeing it that way rather than having a more complicated calendar pop up. Um, uh, the list is, is completely adjustable, so uh, right now it's set to all, obviously, um, and you can see that it lists all 134 lawsuits. If we pick a particular country, uh, let's pick the United States, uh, you'll see that the list adapts to that. It lists only uh, the lawsuits in that country, uh, all these uh, areas of the of Google Sheets are uh, conditionally formatted, so you'll see that it only lists the rows that hit and the other rows are now just plain white, so you're not distracted or getting other information. Um, only countries that have an active lawsuit will be on this list, um, and that list uh, adjusts uh, as things are added or removed. So you'll always only see um, on here the countries that have an active uh, lawsuit. Now if we switch up here to our legal staff, you'll see that again, you can have the giant list of all 84 legal staff members or depending on the country you're in, uh, you'll get only the ones that are there. Um, again, at the user's request in my real job, uh, they insist on this column right here, which is the current time in the time zone that that lawyer is in, uh, which helps the chief counsel and his staff decide whether it's an appropriate time to call. And that uh, obviously changes with each and every country that uh, you switch to. And again, this list here will only have the countries that have legal staff in them. It's not the same list as those that have the lawsuit in them. Uh, the only other chart right now on here is in the upper right. Uh, this is a simple bar chart um, to display lawsuit counts, the amount of being claimed, uh, or most importantly, uh, the accrual amounts, accrual amounts meaning how much money has the company set aside to cover the loss in that lawsuit based on its risk. Um, again, this is adaptable. Uh, you can have the whole count, you can have the accrual amounts, or you can have the actual amount being claimed in various lawsuits. Uh, again, the map, if you click on it, I had originally had a list which detailed those numbers. Um, the users decided that was unnecessary since if you just click on it, it will tell you what the amount is right there. Uh, and again, this uh, can change by country. Uh, so you can see where all the action is by country or by the type of lawsuit. Um, bankruptcy, commercial, corporate, government, and so on and so forth. And again, each, each one of these will just tell you right away what the numbers are. Uh, so again, the lesson learned there is less is more. The users will tell you specifically what they want. 
the exciting things you want to do as a designer are not necessarily the things um, that are going to appeal to the users. Uh, okay, let's take this off for a sec. Uh, okay, so any questions? Um, I have a question, Joe. I think you did a really nice job explaining that. Um, I'm wondering, you talk about it as hypothetical and really um, just describing a prototype. Maybe we're just all using different language. Um, uh, but either way, I'm curious about whether this is going to be used in the future or uh, testing, trying to learn some skills. Uh, for this specific one, I'm, I'm trying to learn some skills. Uh, we are doing similar things with this already, um, not this specific one. Uh, and, and this has become a trend. We are, we are constantly being asked to come up with new things. Um, they are continually trying to sort of get the benefit. There are programs that will do this sort of thing. Uh, for instance, the maps and the like, uh, such as Tableau and the like. Um, but uh, the company, the people here want to use things that they're already familiar with, and the company doesn't want to spend the money. So this has been a great chance for me to really explore uh, Google, Google Sheets um, and, and Microsoft Excel further in, in ways that I hadn't before. OK. Um. I'm also curious um, about, you know, when when students say that they're going to do a project that's work related, we pause and then we say, well, there are pros and cons about doing that. Um, can you share some of those pros and cons with our audience? Right. Um, that uh, the the previous class we had together, I think it was five five three. Um, yeah, I had. Uh, similar ideas for uh, these interactive um, applications based on, on Google Sheets and, and Microsoft Excel. Um, when, when we do them at work, uh, you find that uh, the audience is a very fickle thing, that um, the people who want to get involved, the enthusiasm uh, can wane pretty quickly if they are told to go in a different direction. Um, we are, my company is in a constant state, it seems, of reorganization. Uh, so the person you met with the week before may now be doing something completely different, uh, in, in which case you're stuck. Um, or you and the person you're working with may think of a great application only to find that the person who owns the data at the company does not want to share uh, and wants to sort of remain in their silo. So. Uh, between the office politics, um, the uh, constant questions Question. of uh, who's going to pay for all this and, and why should I be helping you when I have a thousand other things to do, uh, all that makes it much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Joe, <laughs> could, could, you, yeah, um, could you go back to your slides? I think it was like the fifth or sixth slide. Yeah. Wait, use cases? Um, no, maybe it's the previous one. Um, just keep going back. I'll recognize it when I see it. No. Okay. Um, so I think it's the other direction. If I don't find it, then I'll just remember my question. Keep going. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about Geek Google Sheets? As and again, like now that we've I've seen what you've done, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the ease of entry. Right. Um, at at work, we tend to use uh, Microsoft Office three sixty five uh, things like Excel online. Um, that people have had mixed experiences with that, uh, and some of the things that people really want to get to are, are sort of locked down and require a VPN access. Um, so in, in, as is typical in a big company, people look for alternatives and, and Google Sheets has, has popped up 
as a decent alternative that people can get to from their home and on the road, uh, as opposed to having to connect to the company systems. Um, the IT security guys here obviously have big problems with that. Uh, and Google Sheets, uh, for instance, uh, if there are images in your Google Sheets, they won't appear on uh, an iPad app. Uh, not yet, at least, anyway. So there are, there are limitations. But um, there are an enormous number of uh, YouTube videos and, and free services that will teach people how to do things in Google Sheets. And that, that has become really popular. Um, and for some reason, the, the Sheets is a lot more popular uh, than, say, Google Docs or, or the slides. Um, I think that's because most people like to send around PDF of the slides. Uh, and the, I guess they're wary about the documents. But uh, that, that's why we've been turning to Google Sheets. And because it's something they're familiar with, it's much easier to get people on board with a project uh, than, than trying to uh, have them trained in something new. We have a great many software products here that are great for uh, litigation support or for trial preparation. Um, we have one in particular called Relativity, which can do almost everything you can think of. Uh, the problem is it can do everything. And so you're basically being launched into a product with what looks like a giant blank sheet and it's expecting you to know what to do. Um, it's impossible to get people to sit down for, for training for things like that. So anything they're familiar with, uh, that's, that's the way we have to go just to get things used. Okay, thanks. Sure. <clears throat> you know, Joe, can I ask you something? Um, I, I was wondering how you get feedback and is it structured in any way? I mean, a couple of times you would say, well, someone let me know that, <clears throat> you know, you don't have to show the, the amounts of each lawsuit because they can always see it on the bar charts alone. Um, I mean, but do you, you have a structured way of getting and tracking feedback? Um, you know, like do you test in front of someone where you, or, or they test it in front of you and you watch them? Or? Um, there, there are, there's a core group that, uh, I can rely on to, to be able to sit down and walk through things and sort of get direct feedback. Uh, some of these people are, I don't know whether you'd call them evangelizers or connectors. There are people who are connected to a lot of other folks uh, who will also sit down with them. Uh, the problem is we're so spread out. Uh, if I can get people to, to a simple uh, go-to meeting or, or a Skype uh, call, uh, we can do it in person. Otherwise, um, what I mentioned of, of, of setting up something that they can do on their own time and sort of email back or, or I am back their, their feedback, that's the best we can hope for. So, so it's not really structured. I mean, you don't say, could you answer these five questions about this product? Right. Uh, and I watch you um, and think aloud as you're using it so that I hear everything that you're going through. It's kind of filtered, it sounds like, by what they, you know, what occurs to them and what they, sort of they highlight it and they, they'll send you what's sort of bothering them the most or what they enjoy the most, I guess. Right. We, we have difficulty uh, surveying employees. We, we suffer a great deal from survey fatigue. Um, uh, a lot of businesses have become obsessed with a, a system called NPS, which is a net promoter score. And that is based on constantly getting feedback from your customers, even if your customers are somebody else in your company. Um, and so uh, getting people to answer a set of questions is incredibly difficult. Okay. It's just that usually that way you're getting the same issues covered by everyone rather than you know one person deals with what they're particularly feel like discussing it's it's sort of this idea of being able to add things up in a sense so if you're getting the right. same question you can say oh this guy liked it this guy but this guy didn't so maybe i better come up with something in between instead of sort of they're just sort of giving you what strikes them as the most 
you know, bothersome or interesting. That, that's the reason you would do it structured is so that you're getting a fair comparison. I mean, it's, it's still pretty raw, but at least <clears throat> by asking the same questions, you're getting the same issues, you know. Yeah, I, I was envious of a lot of the, the medical studies where they were able to do that uh, down to the point of, of uh, not only having the written surveys, but also uh, being able to tape their interactions with everybody and, and, and require extensive responses. Uh, I, would, I would love to see somebody in my field even figure out a way to do that. Yeah, I almost think you'd have to come up with an incentive. I mean, and that's how I feel anyway. If someone wants me to run a survey, even if Panera wants me to, I, I need to get something for it, you know, a free deal or something. Or, I mean, it's my time. It's worth something. And, you know, so but sometimes if you work with management, you can get some sort of an incentive system built into that. <clears throat> um, that can sometimes free things up a little bit. <laughs> but it it really it really depends on getting support from management at a at a real level, you know. Right. Like their salary, you know. If you <laughs> this is part of why we're paying you, and uh, we expect you to answer these questions, sort of thing. But it's difficult sometimes to get that. It is. Well, I. Are there any more questions? Otherwise, uh, I really appreciate that, Joe. It's, been, it's really an interesting discussion. I like your graphics, and I uh, appreciate the uh, translation from concepts into images. That's some nice Thank visualization you. there. Thanks, Joe. Nice job. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll be in touch with the, with the little piddly things, as usual. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Seems like a plan. Thanks, folks. Uh